Who's got the donuts? All right, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, if you have your Bibles with you, open up to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. What? Ephesians chapter 2. Okay. Uh, Ephesians 2. Uh, starting at... Uh, we'll start at verse 1. It says, And you have the quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature uh, the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherein, uh, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved. And hath raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace uh, in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Uh, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Uh, for we are with workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained uh, that we should walk in them. So we'll stop there. We are dealing with the subject of grace this morning. Uh, so we're going to be defining the word. We're going to be looking at it as far as a little bit of its usage in the Old Testament and New Testament. And then we're going to be looking at some error that people uh, take the word and, and twist it. And, and teach some uh, certain certain type of error regarding uh, grace and grace of God. Okay, so we are in a series uh, basically on words and context. Uh, last week, uh, for those that were here, we were looking at the word repentance. And um, one of the main errors that a lot of people teach, I guess, with regard to repentance is in dealing with regard to salvation. Uh, though the word itself literally means to turn, or uh, that has one of the meaning, and then also it has a meaning uh, to change your mind. It's a change of mind. Uh, most folks, uh, with regard to repentance and salvation, deal with it on the basis of the fact that, like, um, if you don't have, uh, I guess what you would call fruit, uh, and that's pretty subjective. Some people would argue and say, like, okay, uh, if he hasn't quit, uh, uh, you can go down the line of, of any kind of number of behaviors. Oh, he hasn't quit uh, cussing, drinking, and all these other kinds of things. Uh, then he hasn't really repented, so he was never really born again to begin with. And so they 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 kind of take it kind of far out. But the the truth is, is that a person, with regard to repentance, as far as re with regard to with regard to salvation, uh, scripturally it comes down to. What do they believe about Christ, and then whether they whether or not they call on Christ? But the word itself actually has you change your mind. So if you have an attitude, a mindset, or a behavior or something that you are in, if you adopt God's attitude towards it, you repent it towards it, then you would you would then reject whatever you were holding, and you would adopt God's attitude and mind towards that. Um, anyways, we are looking at grace this morning. And in particular, uh, well, well, we'll see the error. The word grace, uh, you only have actually two words that are used, uh, strangely. Uh, in the Old Testament, there's a word called uh, chen. It, it looks like chen, uh, uh, C-H-E-N. And then you have, well, at least that's what, how you would transliterate it. And then you have in the New Testament, the Greek word would be charis. Uh, they both carry kind of a similar concept. Uh, as far as Ken, 
you would have, it's translated uh, grace 38 times, favor 26 times, graciousness twice, pleasant once, and precious <laughs> once, well favored, uh, for a total of basically 69 usages of, of, the, of the term in the Old Testament. Uh, you have, for charis, uh, basically 156 uses of it in the New Testament, uh, translated primarily as grace or favor, also as far as thanksgiving and pleasure, and then there's also miscellaneous usages in the New Testament uh, form that we see most expressed, at least in the verses. You're, uh, you, this is where we, we're going to get our primary concept of the usage, though you see it somewhat expressed, uh, though the word itself is not clear, defined as such, but it, you see in, in usage, the, the concept of God's enabling or God's uh, like God's gifting. Uh, you, you see it more as like a okay, God giving favor, but it's God's enabling or God's gifting. The, the word itself also means gift. Uh, it, it's, um, it's, it's like a gift, it's like a, like a, like a present. In Ephesians, where, where we find ourselves here, um, we're told that by grace you're saved, and then through faith. Grace, uh, there's an acronym that is given uh, quite often that a lot of people like to use is, uh, the G would be God's riches at Christ's expense. Uh, it's also, again, as I mentioned, God's favor. Now the reason why we would say is, is in God's, uh, God's favor, or but rather God's enabling, uh, is because grace is always coupled quite often with uh, the work of the Spirit. And it's something that it's, it's, a, it's a gift of God. We see that primarily here in this passage, um, which is primarily referencing salvation. Uh, starting at verse 4, so, But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, okay, hath quickened us, or made us... Make, made us alive together with Christ uh, by grace you are saved. So it's kind of like a summary statement as far as what God did giving us life by the death of Christ. Well, not only his death, but also his resurrection that he was raised again from the dead. Uh, the eternal life that we receive whenever we receive Christ, um, you are saved by the grace of God. So in other words, it's, it's something that, it's something, it's God, the word mercy almost could be synonymous, but it's a different word, and then it has a different concept. But here it has very similar usage, in that it's God showing basically what we don't deserve to us uh, because of His love. And it's His love that motivated Him to be able to go ahead and not only just send His Son, but to uh, be the propitiation for our sins, and not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. And to make available to us when you know, honestly, we deserve to be destroyed for our sin, and not just us, but also the whole world. And then, not only hath he um, quickened us together with Christ, in verse 6, he says he had made us, he had raised us up together, made us to sit uh, together in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. So we have not only just eternal life, we have salvation, but we have great riches. We have, as Peter talks of it, uh, an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that fadeth not away. Uh, we have treasure in heaven. Uh, we have something that is awaiting us that is greater. Now, mind you, we build to that or we accrue to that as we live. If we go to 1 Corinthians 3, that we would read. Well, let, let's go there real quickly. Then we'll come back over here. In 1 Corinthians 3. We'll start at verse 1 just to establish a context, and it says, uh, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able, for ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you and being in strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? Uh, so his, 
this is this is the argument he's putting forth. Okay, you guys are carnal because you're being divided. And here's how he's going to describe that as, For one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos. Are you not yet carnal? Or are you not carnal? Who then is Paul, and who then is Apollos, but ministers by whom you believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? I have planted in Apollos water, but God gave the increase. So that neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. Interesting. You labor for the Lord, he's going to reward. He's, he promises to, to reward you for your labors. Okay, for we are labors together with God. You're God's husbandry, you're God's building. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon, but let every man that uh, take heed how he buildeth thereupon. Uh, for other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Now if any man build upon this foundation, uh, gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Okay, if any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. Uh, this is this is specifically speaking of the time when we're going to stand before Christ and we're going to be presenting. Um, now, mind you, these is these are as believers. We're believers, so we're standing before Christ. We're going to be judged, um, not as in the unbelievers that we read about in Revelation uh, before a great white throne for all the sin that they've committed, but rather we're going to be for how we lived for Christ, uh, what we labored. Uh, that which, as he says here, that which we would have built upon the foundation of, and the foundation being Christ. In other words, what, what did we do with our Christian life? God has gifted us. Uh, God has given us his Holy Spirit. He's given us uh, a gift that we're told about in, uh, not just in Romans 12, but also in First Corinthians, well, later on in this book, in First Corinthians, uh, chapters 12, 13, and 14. Uh, and he calls you a member of his body. Okay, so you're a, a body part of Christ's body, but also he's gifted you and made you a member within the body, his, his church. The expression of that being a local assembly. And the gifting that he's given you is so that the body would profit with all. Not just a greater body of Christ, but also your local assembly that you would have been placed in by the Holy Spirit's leading. And so the gift that you have as you yield to the Holy Spirit's leading and you're exercising that, uh, in, in obedience to him, is to uh, basically benefit the body. So it would strengthen and encourage other believers to want to live for Christ, to want to love the Lord uh, better. And also it would be as to reach out to those that don't know him yet as Savior, uh, so that they could be basically adopted into the family that uh, as you yield, Holy Spirit draws and moves them, <laughs> they would... Uh, you know, that they would receive Christ, and then that they could be brethren, and then we work to, as, uh, well, as Jesus said, uh, you know, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you, uh, and that, lo, he's going to be with us all the way until the end of the world. Okay, so this is uh, God's design, God's desire, and again, that's all under uh, submission. Uh, that's under the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, working in submission to him, co-laboring with him. Now, we put forth the effort, uh, but he gives the, the divine enabling, he gives the leading, uh, and he, he's basically doing the work with us. We're yoked with him uh, in this work. And here's the cool thing about it. <laughs> we get rewarded for it. <laughs> All right? We get divine reward. Now, if it's built, uh, gold, silver, precious stone, that would be good. All right? Wood, hay, stubble is not good because when you put that to fire, that's going to burn. Uh, gold, silver, precious stone would be basically work that is not carnal work. Does that make sense? In other words, you have folks here, uh, the argument put forth that they are laboring, but they're laboring in the flesh. Okay, they're living carnally, they're walking carnally as men, but they're still laboring. And, they're, and it seems kind of silly, but they're arguing, saying, you know, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, another one of, I'm of Cephas, another one said I'm of Christ. And so... He puts forth, you know, who's Paul, who's Apollos, but ministers by whom, you know, you receive the gospel. 
um, it might <laughs> like certain uh, I don't know how to say this basically how sometimes you would look at and again not, I don't say this like an attack against pass or anybody else, but um, you would think of okay a pastor being somebody that is honorable and he should be our pastor is in particular uh, and scripture says that, you know he's worthy of double honor uh, because he labors in the word and doctrine um, but at the end of the day he is a man okay so we don't worship him uh, we worship the Lord we worship God we worship Lord Jesus and he is a minister to us uh, to instruct us to help guide us to help uh, strengthen us to help feed us to help us to be what we should be uh, but ultimately it's it's the Lord we follow him as he's following Christ uh, and again that's not meant as an attack or slam against him or anybody it's simply the fact that uh, ultimately at the end of the day they're just men and so that, that are working in submission to the Lord Jesus and uh, following the Lord himself uh, but we uh, we don't worship another man we don't worship men because the fact is they're just, you know, they're like us. In other words, we're fallible. They're capable of being, uh, still standing. They're capable of going ahead and turning their back and uh, doing crazy things. Uh, you know, praise the Lord. We don't, <laughs> our, you know, our pastor has been somebody that's been honorable and um, been following the Lord closely. And uh, we can rejoice in that. But he's, he's not wanting, he, he doesn't lift himself up or present himself, okay, worship me but rather it's worship Christ. Okay, so these folks were sitting here exalting men, and then Paul points out, wait a minute, we're just servants. You know, it's Christ. The only, the only thing that we have the really the glory in is the fact that we have the Holy Spirit, we have Christ, and Christ has gifted us. Uh, but we're, we're nothing, and it's, it's about Christ. Go back to Ephesians. All right, so we were <coughs> made to sit in heavenly places with Christ by the grace of God, We've been given life by the grace of God. And then it says, well, we are created, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, uh, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Uh, and so uh, we are empowered to be able to serve uh, by the grace of God. And again, this is all God's gifting. This is God's uh, enabling now, there are some individuals that want to take, for I'm not sure why, other than the, just it would be satanic deception. Uh, they want to take this concept of grace and pervert it, and they say that uh, God's grace teaches, you know, in particular five different things. Uh, specific to salvation uh, but they teach five different things regarding the grace of God that uh, are pretty bad error they tend to call them the doctrines of grace anymore it used to be called uh, Calvinism but they call them the doctrines of grace um, the reasoning behind what they call them okay let me read a small portion of an article here it says uh, the doctrines of grace are so called because these are five major uh, headings of theology often identified as the five points of Biblical Calvinism can uh, contain the purest expression of the saving grace of God. Each of these five doctrines, uh, radical depravity, sovereign election, divine, or definite atonement, irresistible call, and persevering grace, supremely display the sovereign grace of God. These five headings stand together as one comprehensive statement of the saving purposes of God. For this reason, there is really only one point of the doctrines of grace, namely that God saves sinners by His grace and for His glory. Okay, that doesn't sound bad. Uh, but here's what they, well, uh, keep reading, it says, uh, these two realities, God's grace and glory, are inseparably bound together. Uh, what most magnifies God's grace, most magnifies His glory. And that which most exalts God's grace is the truth expressed in uh, the doctrines of grace. Here is what they mean by that, though, is that um, there's a little acronym called the TULIP, and uh, the T on the tulip would be total depravity. 
uh, you can define it as total inability. That's what they would mean. That's actually what they mean by that. Though they wouldn't want to um, acknowledge that to be the case. So, total depravity, they say basically that man is totally depraved and that as we read here in Ephesians chapter 2, that uh, you have the quickened which were dead in trespasses and sins. Right. So we were dead prior to God making us alive. And that, uh, verse 5, because even when we were dead in sins, uh, hath quickened us together with Christ. So we were dead. And then here's, here's their logic, here's their argument. What does a dead man do? Can a dead man respond to anything? No. Why? What's that? Not alive. Okay. Right. <laughs> yeah, he's not alive, so he's not responsive. All right. So what that they say? Okay. So in order for you to be made alive or become alive, you have to be regenerated first to be able to even respond to anything. And then, uh, but because the thing is, it's all God. God handles all that. Uh, you have unconditional election. Okay, so in other words, God elects who's to be saved and who's not. <coughs> this is not what the Bible teaches. I'm just putting forth right. their argument and their reasoning. Okay, this is their, this is a perversion of grace. Right. So, okay, uh, because man is dead in sin, he is unable and stubbornly unwilling to initiate a saving response to God. In light of this, God from eternity past mercifully elected a particular people unto salvation. Now, you go to chapter one of Ephesians. Uh, just a page over, uh, chapter 1. Uh, we'll start at verse 1. But uh, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace be to you in peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, blessed be God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, uh, having predestinated us unto Christ, or excuse me, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children uh, by Christ Jesus to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, uh, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved, okay, in whom we have redemption through his bloody <coughs> forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. That, that's another uh, section where they're also taking the concept of grace. So it's God's grace that is responsible for not only you being made alive, it's God's grace uh, that's responsible for you even to be elected. So it's a, a demonstration of his grace that he would choose uh, some and that he would predestine you towards uh, being adopted or being, being chosen to, to, to go to heaven is what they're basically saying. That's their argument. All right, so in other words, um, you don't have a say or you don't really have a choice into whether or not you go to heaven, but rather it's of God's good pleasure, of his good will, that he chooses that. Uh, living in atonement. Okay, the purpose of Christ's atoning death was not to merely make men savable and thus leaving the salvation of humanity contingent of man's response to God's grace, Rather, the purpose of his atonement was to secure the redemption of a particular people. And then, all whom uh, <laughs> Christ has elected and Christ, uh, all whom God has elected and Christ died for will be saved. Okay, uh, many reform, well, we'll just leave it at that. So in other words, Christ's death wasn't sufficient to pay for the sins of the whole world, but rather, uh, and here, that, that's, yeah, which, they go back to here where he says that he hath chosen some and that he has predestinated them towards you know, the adoption of the Son. So in other words, uh, God's great gift, the sacrifice of Christ uh, on our behalf and then him being raised from the dead uh, is only good for you know, whoever God had chosen. And since we don't really have to say that, since we're dead anyways, you know, you end up, if you follow this, well, okay, there's two other points. I'll just read them real quickly. Irresistible grace. So in other words, um, 
they go back to John chapter 6 where Christ speaks of the fact that uh, whom the Father hath called, you know, them will he draw. And so, um, and we see if you keep following in the context in John chapter 6 that he's calling everybody. In other words, it's the same word that he uses that if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. So in other words, God's not drawing just an elect few, a select few, but rather God's drawing all men to himself. He wants all to be saved. Um, but anyways, so there's an irresistible grace. So in other words, God, his grace, when he expends it, when he uh, demonstrates it, there's no resisting it. Uh, now that also is an illogical argument for a second reason, uh, which is pretty obvious. How many of y'all were saved the first time you got were witness to? I've actually met a few people that have gotten saved like the first time they actually sure were happens. witness to. Okay, but by and large, how many, you know, not very many people. Usually it's sometimes months, weeks, other times years before they actually receive Christ. Um, Quite frankly, how many, <laughs> how many, <laughs> just even on a human level, okay, not even speaking of with God, but like how many of y'all have ever hurt somebody that has shown great like mercy or grace towards you? In other words, you behave in an inappropriate manner to somebody that, hey, they've, they've displayed, you know, they've either given a gift or they've in the way they treated you, treated you in a manner that has been very like loving, but you have either misinterpreted that and then you just act wrongly towards them and hurt them. All right, we do that towards God all the time. And so the fact is, you know, that's resisting His grace. In other words, you don't go to Acts chapter two. Acts chapter two. Start at verse 36. Uh, okay, therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made this same Jesus, whom ye crucified, both Lord and Christ. Okay, now when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts um, and said to, unto Peter and to the rest of the uh, apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Uh, then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of, the, uh, name of Jesus Christ, for the remissions of sin, and you shall receive uh, the Holy Ghost. Or you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Go to chapter 6 as well. Oh, I'm sorry. Go back to chapter, it's five. Uh, Verse 29, okay, then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. Uh, the God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom he slew and hanged on a tree. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince, a savior, uh, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. This is when 
uh, Peter and John were being questioned on the fact that they were preaching uh, Christ in the synagogue, and then what had happened was is that they had been warned before, and then they were beaten, and then they were taken again, and then they were told that, you know, we're basically going to kill you, we're going to get rid of you guys, uh, and then he's, you know, it's not lawful for you to do this, so their argument is, they're, they're responding back, you know, whether it be lawful. Uh, we, need, we need to obey God rather than men. And then uh, verse 32, and ye, and we are his witnesses of these things, and so is also the Holy Ghost whom God hath given to them that obey him. Okay, verse 33, and when they heard that, they were cut to the heart and took counsel to slay them. Um, they, I know it seems kind of silly, but the folks that were there, not only that Peter preached at Pentecost, and then also here right now that he's refuting uh, about the fact that whether or not they were allowed to go ahead and preach, uh, responded in similar fashion. Okay, they were cut to the heart, and they had an awareness of a few things. One, they were there, present, and he caused them. In both instances that you slew, you hanged on a tree, you were responsible for the death of Christ. Okay, and like literally, they were. All right, for they were the ones that were been calling out, crucify him, crucify him, uh, whenever they had uh, not only just taken counsel, and then they had, they had put, put him forth to be uh, judged by Pilate, and then whatever had Pilate, Pilate had brought before the Barabbas, and um, that, that whole situation. But you have folks there, now mind you, this is Christ. He's coming, he's offering himself. Yes, he would have had to have died, but he's presenting himself as king of the Jews, and we read in John chapter 1, the summary of that, that he came unto his own, but his own received him not. Okay? Understood, that's resisting. Does it make sense? If you are being offered something as a gift, that's grace offered to you, they are resisting. All right, so grace isn't irresistible. All right. Does that make sense? Sure. Okay, the logic of it is basically if you can resist, didn't Peter say that once that they always do resist the Holy Ghost? Thing? That was Paul. Oh, okay. And that was in response to the fact that he was angry <laughs> at being chased out again and then having folks that's later on that's later on in Acts, yeah, but that was basically example of resisting the, the, of the grace of God though. They were resisting the Holy Ghost. Thing. Yeah. Uh, and then your final point would be P perseverance mm -hmm. of the saints. Okay, the particular people of God has elected uh, and drawn to himself through the Holy Spirit will persevere in faith. Um, okay, none of those whom God has elected will be lost. They are eternally secure in him. Um, the argument there is that the evidence of somebody that has been chosen by God is that they continue, they persevere. Uh, they like in 1 John where... Um, they they were that were among us were um, they turn basically they turned back because they were not of us and so they because of the fact that they turned away from Christ or they fell away from Christ from walking with Christ then they weren't really truly a believer to begin with so they weren't really chosen so that's something also that a lot of people like to tend to take uh, though they may not accept all the other points they might take or they might have that as an influence in their thinking with regard to uh, believers and, and believers that live in sin or that walk in sin uh, for any period of time in their life. Here's the problem with that, though, is that um, at any given time you could be in a position where you, either because you're deceived by your own flesh or your own fleshly desires, uh, you give in. Uh, to temptation, you give in to the world, you give in to Satan, uh, influence on your life, and okay, you're in sin. The fact is, if you've trusted Christ as, as, as your Savior, if you trusted Christ, uh, you're our believer, you're secure in Him. He sealed you with His Holy Spirit, and uh, you're sealed until the day of redemption. Uh, the fact is, almost without exception, almost every book within the New Testament, at least I know the epistles, are written specifically to address 
issues that a church has. Uh, if you look at Ephesians, they were he was constantly. If you start in verse in chapter four all the way through the end, he's he starts dealing with them. Um, well, we'll look we'll look at verse or excuse me, chapter five. Uh, chapter five, starting in verse three, it says, "But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness." Covetousness, let it not be once named among you, has become its saints. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. Okay, for this you know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Okay, let no man deceive you. This is like a reinforcement of what he had just stated. With vain words for, because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Okay, be ye not therefore partakers with them. For you were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Now he's going to give a specific command here. He says, walk as children of light. Uh, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. And then have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. If we were to look at... Um, Revelation chapter 2 in particular, you have Ephesus as being presented as a model church with one major exception that it says that they've lost their first love. So by all standards, you would say that, okay, this is a model that you would want to follow. Now, it seems kind of silly, but think through with me. Think through this with me. Why would he be commanding somebody that would be, you know, considered a, a model citizen or a model person or a model church that you're not supposed to be filthy. You're supposed to avoid filthiness. You're supposed to avoid fornication and all these things that he says they're ashamed. It's, it's a shame to be even named. You know? You, you, you because guys, it can't happen. What's that? Because it can't happen. It's a possibility, yeah. It's quite probable that they might have had an issue there too with that. Well, I mean, there wouldn't, you wouldn't have a need to address it other than that there's a possibility for it and then also that there aren't possibly even dealing with it. With Corinth in particular, it was like, okay, you guys are not only just dealing with the carnality, but they had somebody that was in the, in the midst of the congregation actively involved in uh, an immoral relationship. And so the way they were dealing with it was, well, really they were saying basically we're more loving than God, so it's okay, you know. And they, they didn't actually deal with it according to what God wanted to, which was, you need to get right. <laughs> but anyway, so the thing is, most of, well, even just in that subject, fornication, if you look through on just the New Testament, how often it's named and addressed as far as not only to avoid, but also as a fruit of the, uh, a fruit of the flesh. You know, the work of, is a, is a work of the flesh is another word. That's a natural... <laughs> Uh, product of your flesh left to itself. Uh, if, un if, if unchecked, if undisciplined flesh is just left to run wild, fornication is one of the things that it's going to want to gravitate towards or run to or want to express itself as. Even on just that, um, you need the grace of God. All right? And so the fact is, uh, by the way, that's a choice. Um, just something to think about. If you didn't have a choice, and if the idea behind perseverance also is the fact that because this is all of God's doing, uh, it's it's basically it's like automatic, right? So in other words, you don't have a free will because it's God that imposes. Basically, God imposes His will on you, and so because you don't really have a choice about salvation to begin with either. I'm not saying that as okay for he's coming in. It's basically we're addressing some of the errors that people talk about with regard to grace. Uh, and ultimately it's because of the fact that, okay, they say that they, they pervert to his God's grace and they say, okay, well, how can God be sovereign but yet man have a free will? And the fact is it's pretty easy. It's because that's how he made it. It doesn't make him any less sovereign. He's just very loving. Um, but the fact is because they're trying to argue this stupidly, I think, and it's a stupid point, instead of just taking what the Word of God for what it says, they um, they sit there and they say, okay, well, since 
God's sovereign man, it's not possible for man to be able to have a free will at the same time because otherwise it would violate his sovereignty. And so um, ultimately, that line of reasoning, that line of thinking puts God as the uh, uh, author of sin and you know anything that happens in my life is basically going to be God's fault when, if you think about this, any command that God gives is an appeal to your will. Does that make sense? In other words, if God commands you to do something, God tells you to do something, that leaves you with a choice. Now, I mean, <laughs> if you choose wrongly, obviously there's going to be consequences, but the fact is, it's that still, you, it's a choice that's left. He puts a ball in your court. You make a choice at that point. You know, am I going to submit to God? Am I going to obey God? Or am I going to be disobedient? Uh, the fact is, it's a choice that's actually offered. So inherent to that would be, I have a will that I exercise. You know, God's allowed that freedom for me. And he expects me, obviously, to choose wisely. He expects me to exercise it wisely. Uh, but he, any command is an appeal to the will. Is, is basically, you want to look at it like that. So any command that's given by God... Uh, is an appeal to your will, so you have a free will. Anyway, so these doctrines of grace are perversions of the grace of God. The grace of God is ultimately a gift. It is also God's divine enabling. Um, we're out of time for this. God's divine enabling to be able to perform what He has entrusted for you. In other words, I need God's grace. Uh, I God's grace and salvation. I need God's grace. He presents it. He's done everything for you, and then you have freedom to choose whether or not you want to receive His gift or not. When you receive it, then He gives grace. He gives not only gifting, uh, divine supernatural gifting as far as being able to serve Him, but He's the one that actually gives us the enabling. You know, as, he, as we submit, as we yield, uh, He talks about in Ephesians 5 that, um, be not drunk but what, but be filled with the Spirit, uh, if we walk in the Spirit, we shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And that, uh, in Acts 1.8, that ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me. Anything that we're going to ever be able to do for the Lord uh, comes as a gifting uh, and an enabling that he, that he performs. And it's basically our will to choose, yes, Lord, I'm going to respond, yes, Lord, I'm going to yield. Yes, Lord, I'm going to obey. And the cool thing about it is that we are rewarded for that. We make right choices. And so importantly, grace is, grace is God's gifting, God's enabling, God's favor, uh, and it's His goodness in our life. We are rewarded if we submit, if we yield to that. And it is not the perversion of this uh, Calvinism, or the, what others would try, try to call it anymore, as the doctrines of grace, um, because what they do is they basically make God out as um, almost basically kind of how like the Mormons think of God, or how the Muslims think of God, which is very similar, very similar concept. Um, we don't, which is not not right, not godly. Does anybody have any questions? Um, we're going to be looking at the predestination and then uh, foreordained next week. And then we're going to be looking at Day of the Lord <coughs> following that. All right, but if we have no questions, then we're dismissed.